back for that one. Today she'll be reading her piece recently published in an anthology called Dirty Laundry, which will be available. Please welcome Kelly Carlin. Let me mic you, dear. Okay, darling. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So grateful. This is so slick. Isn't Oprah's going to love us, oh. isn't she? Okay. I love sticking things. That's perfect, things. darling. <laughs> Come on up, girl. Sit down. <laughs> Make yourself at home. <clears throat> Thank you for having me, all of you. I'm very, very excited to be here. This is called How I Spent My Summer Vacations. It's 1972, Carnegie Hall, New York City. Outside on the marquee, my dad's name shines for all of Midtown Manhattan to see. Carnegie Hall presents George Carlin. A huge coup for my dad, who grew up a latchkey kid not 60 blocks away in an area just west of Harlem called Morningside Heights. He and his kind called it Irish Harlem. Inside the theater, I sit in the corner of the dressing room, munching on some potato chips. Dad anxiously paces the floor, going over material in his head, while Mom sits on the couch, somehow managing to have a deep and intense conversation with someone she has met only 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Suddenly, we get the knock. Two minutes, George. Mom, Dad, and I leave the quiet of the room to make our way through the bowels of the building. As we walk past people, they say things to us like, go get him, George, knock him dead. I do not know these people, and they do not know me, but they know my dad. Everyone knows my dad. As we come up from the basement, we start to hear feet stamping and the chant, George, George, George. <laughs> there are over a thousand voices saying my father's name over and over again. And when he steps out onto the stage, they erupt into a roar, and every hair on my body stands. I feel energy all around me. I feel extremely alive. And although I understand that they aren't cheering for me, at nine years old, I still feel like I'm a part of it all. Growing up in the shadow of my father's fame did something funny to my head. Somehow it made me feel much bigger and yet much smaller at the very same time. It was all very Alice in Wonderland-like. As a young girl, I didn't know how to metabolize that amazing feeling I would get when I would hear the roar of the crowd in response to my father, and so I didn't understand that it wasn't really mine to have and hold. No one told me that if I took in too much of it, my mind would become as confused and distorted as if I had taken in some kind of psychotropic drug. And yet, there it was, crackling, luminous, and filling up the air all around me, palpable, immediate, there for the taking. And God knows, it was the 70s. <laughs> a time when everyone, including my parents, were jumping down that rabbit hole by ingesting everything they could get their hands on to take them out of their smallness and connect them to something much bigger and brighter. And so while others took in LSD, Reds, and Bennies, I took in the roar of the crowd, the electricity in the air, and the shine of my father's fame, and let it fill me and make me larger than I actually was. But that feeling never lasted long. Backstage, when we would walk into a room, all eyes would move to my father, and then people with faces beaming and hands outstretched would move toward him, telling him something they loved about him, usually a line from his show, which they would try to say just like him, and which always made me cringe. <laughs> or they would hand him a gift, my favorite, a tie-dye t-shirt with a drawing of what I assumed was his likeness, but because it looked more like a combination of Jesus and Charles Manson, <laughs> I was never truly sure. God help us all. My mother and I would then be introduced, and people would politely spend a nanosecond of time with us, but then we'd be quickly forgotten. It was as if, poof, we had just disappeared. In order for me to feel seen, I would have to work it. We would be backstage in some college town, and Dad would be surrounded by well-wishers, and I, feeling small and ignored, would come up to them and then just wait. 
Then some person might glance at me, unsure of who this child was, and I would say to them inside my head, you don't know who I am, do you? <laughs> then I would touch my father or ask him a question, saying subtly to the doubter of my status, I'm with him. <laughs> they would then smile at me with understanding and connection in their eyes, and I would then feel safe and seen and think, yes, now you understand, now you know who I am. Believing that my status, my connection to the crackling luminosity had been affirmed in their eyes, not understanding that in reality, I was only trying to affirm my own status in my own eyes. And not that I nor other people thought or did any of these things consciously, no, absolutely not. The effects of fame work in a much more mysterious way inside the dark recesses of our minds. Here's how it works. The part of our mind that is hardwired for the worshiping of, let's say, a god or a higher power or whatever, is the part that is also utilized in the worship of celebrity. It is the part of our psyche that connects us to the sacred, and yet because we've all been miseducated, alienated, and hugely disappointed by this strange thing we call life, we do not recognize that we are worthy of this inner sacredness, and so we fling it out. We project it so we can then have some sort of safe yet dishonest relationship with it. I mean, Jesus Christ, we don't want to get too jummy w chummy with our inner God now, do we? I mean, who knows what might fucking happen? You know, like Christians might actually start acting like Christians. <laughs> <laughs> but no, in this country we take our godliness and we throw it out of ourselves and onto every celebrity we can get our hearts and minds around and all we are left with is an emptiness that sometimes feels like it will never, ever be filled. And so... This is how I spent many of my summer vacations and most of the next 30 years of my life, unconsciously flinging my inner sacredness out and onto my father so that I might feel like somebody, anybody. A month before my father died, the last time we saw each other was for his birthday lunch in May. Dad, his girlfriend Sally, my husband Bob, and I went to Ford's filling station in Culver City. He got a big hamburger. I think I got the ribs. It was a great time. As always, we laughed a lot, talked about this crazy world, and caught up with all that was going on in our lives, like Bob and my future trip to Scotland, and if Dad had seen the most recent episodes of Foyle's War on PBS. He loved British mysteries. As an adult, being with my dad was always fun because making him laugh or smile or showing him a new angle on the world was deeply satisfying. I mean, who wouldn't love having the power to do that to someone who does that for the world? And somewhere during that lunch, I realized that when I was with my father, I could more easily plug into that inner shininess or sacredness that I spoke of before. It was as if I could consciously use his higher vibration to help jumpstart mine. I knew I was no longer borrowing his or only seeing him as the source of it. I was now consciously accelerating my own vibration with his, like how a tennis player becomes a better player when she plays with someone of a higher caliber. I was like an electron jumping to a higher orbit. And the more I claimed it as my own, the more it felt like we were keeping each other dancing at that higher orbit. After saying our goodbyes, I was walking up the street to the car when a voice came into my head suddenly. It both scared and thrilled me. It said, Kelly, you can no longer depend on him to be the source of your ability to live from a higher orbit. You now have to and can do this for yourself. I did not know how serious this voice was. I did not know that that would be the last time I would see my father. And so here I am, putting these words down on these pages with the hope that it might inspire you to find that sacredness, that luminous godliness that lives in you so that I too can feel safe enough to find the God that lives within me because God knows it feels like we are all running out of time. Oh.